Hello? Oh, I can hear you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Bob Rosenfeld, one of the members of the program committee. And we put together a program like this several times a year. And we're always welcome. You're just welcome to come visit us. Uh, I want to first of all thank the Senior Center for inviting us to use this lovely facility. Uh, we're really glad that they're such an enthusiastic supporter of what we do. Uh, today's program is our last one in this building for the semester. Next week we move to the Savoy Theater. And that will be the first of three film programs led by Rick Winston. And uh, it will start with the film It Happened One Night, which is a famous on-the-road book story. And um, for those of you who are a little old, <laughs> the stars are Claude Gable, Claudette Gobert. Uh, and if you have any questions about that or any suggestions for other programs, please talk to me or any one of our members of our program committee who can raise their hands. And, if you can recognize the rest of their bodies, <laughs> I'll talk to you. Um, as you all know, because here you are, our speaker today is Chris Graff, and I am eager to let him have the stage. Uh, but I cannot <laughs> hand the mic to him quite yet, because I really, really, really want to mention that he's part of a unique group that's ever talked to us entire member of his entire membership of his family have been speakers here. Not, not only Chris, but his wife Nancy sitting in the back of here. His son Jared, their son Jared. I think Nancy has something to do with it too. And their daughter Nancy. So this is cool. This has never happened before. Um, I want to start like a regular person. Okay. It is my great it is my great pleasure to welcome Chris this afternoon. But in this case I like I really mean that. <laughs> it, it is a genuine pleasure. I'm fortunate to know Chris um, and I greatly admire him. Um, he's a person of great integrity and insight, a thoughtful observer with a deep professional journalist understanding of the political history of Vermont. I like him. <laughs> uh, many of you recognize his name from more than 25 years. He was the bureau chief for AP in, in Vermont. And some of you recognize his face, what you can see of it. Uh, because for more than 10 years, he was doing regular television broadcasts on Vermont Public Television a program called Vermont This Week, and a special series called The Governors, which was interviews with, with all the governors who were alive when he was able to talk to them. Um, and so there is no one better informed by decades of thoughtful work and scholarship to talk to us today about the political history of Vermont and to tell us why Vermont is what America wants to be. Uh, thank you for all being here today, since it is one of those rare one in 365 days in which the sun is out in Montpelier, Vermont. For you to sacrifice one hour of sunshine to be here is absolutely the uh, greatest compliment that you can pay me. If I weren't speaking, I wouldn't be here. Uh, and thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Uh, Grace was supposed to introduce me and couldn't be here today. Um, I'm secretly very pleased that Grace wasn't, isn't here today because Nancy told me um, about a week ago when Grace thought she was gonna be here that she had read my book, uh, Dateline Vermont, in preparation for introducing me. Well, that scared the daylights out of me. I haven't read my book in 16 years. 
And so my stress levels went way up thinking, oh my goodness, she knows the details and things that I had long forgotten. So I'm happy that Bob's here uh, so that he can't quiz me on some of the, you know, like, well, on page 246, you see, you said this. It's also wonderful to speak to a mature audience. Let me explain that. Um, Every year for 12 years, I've spoken to Jim Douglas's college uh, class in Middlebury College. Um, he teaches a January term course on state government and politics in Vermont, and I've spoken every year. And I sort of have this set thing that I do. Well, they're, they're supposed to read Dateline Vermont. I've done it for 12 years, and I don't think any of them has ever cracked the book. But, uh, when I first started speaking to them 12 years ago, I would talk about Jim Jeffords' Declaration of Independence. I would talk about Howard Dean. And, and then one year, maybe eight years ago, I started the thing about Jim Jeffords. And they all looked glassy-eyed. And, they, they and, and I just sort of stopped and said to myself, well, it is 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. This is a college audience. Maybe this is the best reaction I can get. And then it occurred to me. And so I asked them to, by a show of hands, how many of you know who Jim Jeffords is? <laughs> and not one hand went up. Wow. And um, afterwards, the assistant professor in that class came up to me and said, you do realize they were eight years old when Jim Jeffords left the Republican Party. And uh, so I said, yeah, I guess they would. And, and I've seen it continue. Uh, when I spoke there this year, none of them knew who Howard Dean was. And it used to be that they all knew who Howard Dean was, and they um, now all they cared about was Bernie. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, speaking of mature audiences, I don't know if you saw recently, I was shocked to see that Tom Salmon uh, was 90 years old. Uh, there was a picture of him where he's living now in Windsor County. And um, Ginny, I don't know if you, you guys protested in Tom Salmon's offices or not. I can't remember that far back. No, but Snelling. It's Snelling. In, yeah. I tried to go to Snelling's office once. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, but golly, that that sort of puts you in perspective when you go, whoa, Tom Salmon's 90. I mean, first of all, those of you who might have been around then and knew what it was like in the 1970s for that group of folks at the Little, Bra Little Valley House or the Brown Derby, it's amazing he survived this long uh, to 90. But uh, uh, it was just wonderful to see the picture of him because he looked exactly the same uh, as he does. And, uh, you know, Tom Salmon was, um, he was just such a great person to cover. He was the person who gave us lines like, education is the fourth leg of the tripod of the Vermont <laughs> state economy. <laughs> In that period, we had uh, uh, Senator Gilbert Godnick. Many of you may have remembered him as the mayor of Rutland or, or Godnick's furniture, all of those stories. Um, you know, he, he used to say things like, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> or that there's always one rotten egg in every bushel of apples. <laughs> or my favorite, you three make quite a pair. <laughs> but the reason I mentioned Tom Salmon was when I first uh, went to the State House as a reporter, it was as a student at Middlebury College, uh, working at the college radio station, and uh, it was to cover his inauguration in 1973. Um, if any of you have read Dateline Vermont, you do know that I went up there uh, years earlier um, as a uh, eighth grade student, I think it was, I was 13 years old, that all students did at that time to meet the governor, uh, see the state house, and uh, in my case, uh, the only memory I carried from there was seeing the men's bathroom in the basement 
the, this ornate men's bathroom with just marble and brass, and it was unbelievable. And me, my classmates and I, the male ones, uh, all, all took pictures of ourselves in, in that bathroom. And uh, then when I came back to the State House as a reporter, I, um, I went to find it. I couldn't find that, that bathroom. And it turns out that it's in the basement, and it's only used for tour groups. Um, and then when Nancy was writing a history of the State House, I found out it had been built, I think it was 1883, uh, around there. Um, and at the time, uh, all the legislators were tired of going out back to the outhouses. And so they built a, uh, this bathroom. And they, it was the only bathroom they needed because there were no women in the State House at that time. So, but I went back to the State House as a, as a reporter at the college level, 1973, to cover Tom Salmon's inauguration. And prior to the ceremony, uh, I was walking up what is now Governor Davis Avenue, uh, next to the pavilion, and uh, there was Tom Salmon, the governor-elect, walking by himself with a state police trooper dressed in civilian clothes. And I was just blown away by that. The fact that there was no entourage, that there was no you know, major secret service, that it was just the governor-elect walking along the street with a uh, state police trooper dressed in civilian clothes. And you can still see that today. You know that, that you will see Phil Scott walking down the street with just a state police trooper. Um, and it is part of what makes Vermont special. And I think it is part of what um, is what I'm going to talk about today. The theme is that we have something very special here. And we take it for granted. And when the rest of the nation sees it, they are shocked and surprised by it. And some of it is that just that. The governor is walking down the street by himself. There's an approachability. Those of us who do live in Montpelier are not surprised if we're at the Montpelier Farmer's Market in the summer and we see Pat Leahy walking along there with his grandchildren. And now if you see him, because he's president pro tem and third line to the presidency, you'll see capital um, uh, security with him. But he's just, he and Marcel are walking along the farmer's market and yet he's one of the most powerful people in America. And that's what we expect in Vermont. We expect that approachability. But I think it also gives our leaders some traits, which is why they become so popular with the rest of the nation. Ours remains a government of human scale. And I'm going to talk about, I think, three people who make this true. Um, and like I said, it's so nice that you're a mature audience because I don't have to go back. I can just, you know what's funny about it, an audience like this? You can just throw out a name. You can say like Fred Tuttle and everyone will laugh because they know exactly the story I'm telling or, or would tell. I'm not going to talk about Fred Tuttle today. But I'm going to start with Howard Dean. And when he ran for president, no one, especially Howard Dean, thought his candidacy would catch on. He thought it would be a way for him to raise the issue of health care at a national stage. He thought there might be a little uh, cachet with him being a doctor talking about health care. And he also, you know, in the back of his head, he held on to this thing, well, you know, maybe I'll do really well in New Hampshire and the nation will take a look at me. Well, the nation took a look at him a whole year before the New Hampshire primary, and they loved what they saw. And what it started with was an appearance before the Democratic National Committee in February of 2003. And Howard Dean's, all, it was a cattle call where all the candidates appeared and they all had, let's say, two minutes to make their case before the entire DNC. And Howard got up there and I remember watching it and thinking at the time, boy, he really sounds nervous. And I was sort of focused on that and thinking, yeah, yeah, you know, 
but everyone else heard the message and they heard what he was saying. And I don't know if you remember this at all, but he, he, he just stood up there and read a number, he didn't read, he was just talking from the heart, a number of questions challenging the establishment. And he said, what I want to know is why in the world the Democratic Party leadership is supporting the president's unilateral attack on Iraq. What I want to know is why are Democratic Party leaders supporting tax cuts? And he went on and on and on. In the Washington press and the rest of those who watch politics went nuts because nobody had challenged the establishment like that. And it was a little like the emperor's new clothes and Howard Dean was the little boy who said, but the emperor has no clothes. And his campaign then took off and those of you who remember, it took off with lines like, you have the power telling people that, and it really resonated, or we are going to take our country back. And what made Howard Dean, and for all, from that moment on, in February of 2003, for almost a year, he was the front runner for the presidential nomination, the Democratic front runner. Uh, Democratic nomination. And he transformed politics, too, in a way that led to the election eventually of Barack Obama with the use of the internet. But when you think about Howard Dean, he wasn't an, or an orator. He was just sort of a pretty humble guy, even though he wasn't very humble in the way we thought in Vermont. We sort of thought, yeah, Pretty arrogant guy. <laughs> but once you step outside the border of Vermont, people see you differently because they see you against the constellation of all the people and leaders they are familiar with. So Howard Dean in Vermont, remember, he used to bring his kids to the governor's office and let them run around because his wife would say, hey, you may be governor, but I'm a doctor and I've got office hours today. It's your turn to watch the kids. <laughs> and he made sure that his governor's schedule always allowed him to attend their hockey teams, the hockey competitions. And sometimes he was the one in the stands that you sort of say, who is that guy yelling you know, <laughs> at the refs and the, you know, stuff like that. But Howard Dean came across in that campaign as honest, as straight, straight talking, um, and being very direct. I remember I campaigned with him early, or covered him campaigning early, in New York City. And uh, he was at a fundraiser where you could tell people weren't really sure who this guy was. But as he spoke, there was a quiet, it was a, one of those very noisy things, um, but people got quiet. And they listened to him, and when they would ask questions, he did something that George Aiken used to do that used to drive the press nuts. He'd answer yes or no. <laughs> Politicians don't do that. <laughs> and you have to remember in 2003 and four. Basically, Howard Dean was running about against a bunch of United States senators. And United States senators cannot speak English. <laughs> they answer every question with a paragraph, or a question, or, you know, they're really good at filibustering. And Howard Dean wasn't. You know, what I say about George Aiken, George Aiken used to go on You Can Quote Me, some of you may remember that, when it actually was a huge show for WCAX. And uh, Mickey Gallagher and Charlie Lewis, they, they would have like 20 questions ready to ask uh, Senator Aiken, and they'd be done with him in 10 minutes. <laughs> because he answered everything either yes or no, and they'd wait for him to then speak, and he wouldn't speak. <laughs> and that's sort of what Vermont politicians do. But it is so unusual outside of Vermont. And that's the case with Bernie Sanders, too. 
Bernie Sanders is straight talking. He is authentic. He and Howard Dean both, they're very different. Absolutely different people, but they tapped into the same vein of public uh, sentiment across the country, people who were dissatisfied, disillusioned. And they felt that there was a, these were two honest leaders who were telling it like it is. Now, those of us who've been around sort of like forever know that Bernie Sanders hasn't changed one line <laughs> since the first time I covered him in 1974. The only thing that's changed is in 1974 when he was running for the US Senate, by the way, against Pat Leahy. Um, in that campaign, uh, Bernie Sanders talked about the billionaires. Now he talks about the billionaires. So he's just changed the M to a B, and otherwise everything is exactly uh, the same. Howard Dean and Bernie Sanders, they come across as absolutely authentic. And you see, you know, Howard Dean, when he was campaigning, he carried his own garment bag. You know, there were pictures of that. Bernie Sanders, you know, there, there's just never an entourage, even when he was at the peak of his campaign. It's just, you would see, there's Bernie. Yeah. And, and I think that that authenticity that is required to succeed in Vermont is what sets them apart when they go across the nation. And I also think then that it comes to the third example that I'm going to use today, which is um, Jim Jeffords' Declaration of Independence. You know, Jim Jeffords, all of you remember Jim Jeffords' days in the House and the Senate, and you know, when he was first elected to the House in uh, 1974, he lived in a camper, an RV, in a parking lot in Washington because he couldn't afford the rents uh, down there. Um, and he, he is one of the few, might be the only at that time, member of the US House or US Senate who never appeared on a Sunday talk show. Had no interest in it. He just did not care. He was a workhorse. He worked hard in the committees, and he got things done. But his Declaration of Independence in 2001, it, it shocked Washington, and it shocked the nation as well. Some of you remember that the majority leader at the time, Trent Lott, called Jeffords' declaration and is leaving the Republican Party a coup of one, an effort to undermine democracy. Because you remember, what happened was the Senate was 50-50. Does that sound familiar? And by changing from a Republican to an Independent and caucusing with the Democrats, Jim Jeffords changed the control of the US Senate, the only time in history outside of an election that control of the US Senate has switched parties like that. Mm -hmm. And he did it, and no one believed he would do it. But remember the details. I mean, this, this does, you know, it is funny that it was 20 years ago. And he's like, really? <laughs> That's the thing when you, I'm talking to these Middlebury College students. You know, to me, it's all current events, and to them, it's ancient history. <laughs> and so I sort of feel like, uh, well, we're watching Ken Burns' Franklin, ben, Benjamin Franklin documentary, and I feel like the people I'm talking about are sort of contemporaries with Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> But the background of Jim Jeffords' decision and what happened there was that Jim Jeffords, the Bush administration had just taken office and the, you know, President Bush uh, wanted to cut taxes by, uh, I think it was $1.4 trillion. Um, and Jeffords thought that was too much. And he said he was gonna vote against it and then there became all this effort to try to win his support. Um, and he said, well, what, you know, what do you need? The horse trading started. Um, and he want, what he wanted Washington to do, what he wanted the White House to do, what he wanted the Congress to do, 
was to fully fund its commitment to special education. He wasn't asking for any pork barrel politics. He just, special education had always been his top priority. And I think that the, when the Special Education Act went into uh, effect, the idea was that the federal government would provide 40% of the funding, uh, and it never did. And Jim Jeffords wanted a commitment that they would do that. And in the end, the, it was dropped from the negotiations as part of the tax cut. They didn't put the money in there. And the White House, they just sort of, well one, they were, they, were, they were new, but two, their arrogance was such that they thought that Jim Jeffords would be like every other senator and he would roll. And matter of fact, after Jeffords voted no, all the press coverage at the time was how the White House was going to seek revenge against Jim Jeffords. There were stories in The Hill where leaked um, um, comments from White House uh, advisors saying, yes, we're gonna make, him, make it very painful for him. And, we think what we're gonna do is we're gonna kill his dairy compact, something that he had spent years and years in acting, and they said, we'll get him, and it won't be one thing. We're gonna go after him for the next one or two years. And they just expected that Jim Jeffords would be like everybody else in Washington. And wanna be a member of the club, and not wanna rock the boat. And in fact, then he decided he would leave the Republican Party, and he would become an independent, and he would change control of the Senate. And right up until the moment he announced that in South Burlington, the White House thought he wouldn't go through it. Trent Lott thought he wouldn't go through with it, because he wouldn't want to hurt all of his friends you know, who were committee chairs, because all the Republicans had waited so long to be committee chairs, they were gonna lose that. And Jim Jeffers just came back to Vermont and said, I have to do what is right. And to me, and he talked about the Republican heritage in Vermont, people that he grew up with, his father who was Supreme Court Justice, General Wing, other important leaders, um, uh, uh, well, he talked about George Aiken, and he talked to uh, about uh, Senator Gibson. Uh, he was very close to the Gibsons. And he said, to be true to them, I can no longer be a member of this Republican Party. It was a shock that was felt all across the nation, and some of you may remember, but he was actually on the cover of both Time and Newsweek in the same week, at a time in history when actually being on the cover of Time and Newsweek actually meant something, uh, which it doesn't so much today. And um, I was in Washington when he uh, truly became an independent, and following him around the Capitol was just remarkable. This was a guy who was so all shucks and is only happy if he could be chopping wood at his home in Vermont. And people were trying to reach out and touch him. And I remember interviewing a man from California um, on the steps of the Capitol when Jeffords was walking down the stairs and, and a man from California had said that, I'm so glad that somebody had the integrity and the guts to do what they said they would do and that they um, needed to do. It's not just these three men. Yes? Uh, can I tell a Jim Jeffords story? Absolutely. OK, when I first came to Vermont. In do you want to use the mic? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, when, when, when I first came to Vermont, uh, in, in the 70s, my job, I worked for uh, Child Welfare, 
and I went around the northern part of the state investigating cases of long-term foster care and then going to court and uh, freeing them for adoption. So uh, Alice, Nick, and I uh, freed about 100 kids in the two years that the project was going. And what strikes out for me is that here in Washington County, I went to a hearing. Now you have to remember that child welfare hearings are totally confidential. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a role in that hearing, you can't come. And nothing is talked about in the newspapers. So who would be there at this hearing but Jim Jeffords? And he was working on behalf of this child. And I, I was so impressed because I knew that this was the beginning of his national, his national campaign and how important, uh, how important publicity would be. And here he was, sitting in the court, acting as an attorney for a foster child. <laughs> it just, I still, I was so impressed with it, I voted for him many, many times. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that to say, so yes. impressive. Well, he used to, you know, before he ran for Congress, uh, he was Attorney General uh, of Vermont. And, um, yes? I have a comment too. Okay. <laughs> I was teaching at the University of Texas at the time that Jeffords did his wonderful thing. And a colleague of mine, I mean, just he came out of the blue and he, and he knew I had a place in Vermont and was planning to retire here. He came out of, the, out of the blue and he said, your senator up there is wonderful. <laughs> so it, it really had you know, effects yeah. all over the country. Yeah. It did. And, um, I think the headline the, on the cover story of Newsweek, on the cover, I think it said, Mr. Jeffords blows up Washington. Uh, and uh, um, it's not just Jim Jeffords, Howard Dean, Bernie Sanders. There is a reason uh, that Jim Douglas was Barack Obama's favorite Republican governor. Um, there is a reason that Phil Scott has leadership positions in national governors. I think there's a reason, by the way, uh, that Vermont um, has had three governors, uh, Snelling, Dean, and Douglas, who chaired the National Governors Association. For a small state like Vermont to get that um, very important prestigious role says something about the respect that the governors have for those Vermont governors. Um, I, I think that what we take for granted here in Vermont is something that the nation is hungry for today. To succeed in Vermont, it requires po politicians to be authentic, approachable, pragmatic, and to exhibit common sense and straight talk. And I think that that's why Howard Dean was so successful in his presidential campaign Bernie Sanders has twice been su oh, so successful. I know, they didn't win. That's a whole other story as to why that happened, um, which I'm actually happy to talk about in the questions. But I think that when there is something that we require of our Vermont politicians, especially governors. So when Jim Douglas ran for governor, uh, he. The Democratic nominee was uh, Doug Racine, and the independent candidate was Con Hogan. I don't know if you remember that. But the three of them had 36 full-out gubernatorial forums around the state. 36. They were pretty tired of each other by the time they were done. But Vermonters demanded it. Vermonters required, they want to see their governors up close. They want to kick the tires. They want to have them in a room this size so you can really get a sense of the person. You can't win an election in Vermont by being invisible, by just running expensive television commercials. You have to be out there and about. And we've seen that with all of our governors. They still, uh, we don't have a governor's mansion. They live in their homes. 
in the days when there were phone books, their <laughs> phone numbers were listed in the phone numbers, their home phone numbers, and we expect that. We have, quite, we have shows like um, Call the Governor on Vermont Public Television or on Vermont Edition or, or whatever, I forget what they call it now, uh, the shows where the governors and the representatives and, and senators. And we expect them to answer every question. And we expect them to know the details of what they're talking about. You know, for uh, Bob mentioned that I uh, did programs for Vermont Public T Television. I did a program called Call the Governor on Vermont Public Television for 15 years. And um, Howard Dean loved to one-up anyone <laughs> on that show and show that he knew. So he would say, you know, someone would call and say, you know, uh, I can't get my road plowed. And Howard would say, well, where do you live? Is it halfway up that hill or all the way up that hill? And he'd say, or do you go around the corner? There's that black mailbox and, and things like that. And Jim Douglas is renowned for his memory and remembering everybody. And people expect that. They want you know, Jim Douglas um, just, he would see you and he'd say, I, I you know, talk about the last time he saw you. And, um, and we want to see that from our leaders. And it is what the nation wants to see. And I think in the end, not to, um, not to belabor this point, but I think it's why Joe Biden won the presidential, the Democratic nomination. You know, he seemed like a common person. He seemed like someone who understood um, what was going on and, and just seemed like a straight, straight talker. And I think that's what Vermont politicians have to do here to succeed. And it's what's special when we get outside of Vermont and people see our leaders there. So I'm, yes. Are you doing questions? Yes, I'm doing questions. So Chris, I have a question. Given Phil Scott is still a Republican, and we went through everything we did with Mr. Dumpster, and we're dealing with pretty intense stuff, do you have any speculation why Governor Scott isn't choosing to become an independent when the Republican Party stands for nothing? Yeah, I, I think when you're governor, it doesn't really matter. I think if he were to want to be in Congress, he would probably be as an independent um, and make it clear that he would not caucus with the Republicans, just like Jim Jeffords. But I think that, you know, in Vermont, we choose our governors based on personality, not party. Um, and so it goes back to what I was saying, that we love to kick the tires. We know our gubernatorial candidates really well. I don't think it really matters to anyone that Phil Scott is a Republican um, because he just acts like Phil Scott, and he does what he wants, and sometimes he's more, cons this was the same thing with Jim, Jim Douglas. You know, Jim Douglas was more, much more conservative than the state as a whole, and people were willing to grant him some of that um, because they liked what he was doing and they liked him as a person. Um, and so I, I think it's more with governors, we, we, we don't focus on the party. Um, and, if, and that's why Phil, I don't think Phil Scott has any interest in being in Washington. But he knows too, I think, uh, that if he ran for the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House, most of Vermont does not want to see the Republicans have the majority. And so that would be the defining um, decision when you mark the ba ballot box. You might love Phil Scott. You might say, hey, I watched him at, Phil, at Thunder Road. But you know what? I am not going to make the Republicans the majority party in the United States Senate. Um, so, yes? I think you really nailed it with the accessibility for the common citizen. It's starting with the building, as you were very well spoke of. I was there probably lobbying for more money for the Green Mountain Club or something. And there was a woman, Joseph, with a group of little children walking around. And a young man with a backpack came to the door. This was before super security just happened. And he came in looking very distressed and said, 
where's the security? And she said, oh, I think he's out back smoking. <laughs> One more thing about Howard Lee. He was a good friend of mine through the Green Mountain Club, and I was so pleased that he chose his governor portrait, portrait of yeah. him in a canoe. <laughs> in a comfortable lake in Yes, yeah. Well, and I, uh, you know, when 9 11 hit, um, it did cause changes even in Vermont. But the, the first change, so my office at the time was in the Thrush Tavern, which was, uh, you know, the restaurant right across the street uh, from the pavilion. And the first immediate response of uh, Governor Dean's administration uh, was Kate O'Connor who was the governor's secretary of civil and military affairs, would come out every morning and put traffic cones outside along the pavilion on the side so people wouldn't park there if they had a car bomb. Now, do you really think if you're a terrorist with a car bomb that you're going to say, oh, look, there's a, a traffic cone there. I'm not going to park there. Um, and I think that we have, you know, that did begin a change. And then, of course, the pandemic has changed the way people are trying, not being able to get in the state house in these last two years, and there'll be changes coming out of it. But um, uh, one of the greatest things as a reporter covering the state legislature was the accessibility. You know, our legislators have no offices. You know, you're standing there looking at them debate in a, off, off the floor you know, as the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem are arguing about something, you're just standing there watching because they have no place to go. Um, or if you sit in the cafeteria, you're bound to see every member of the state legislature. And so it's impossible for our legislators to escape. They, when I was covering the legislature, the legislative lounge did not exist. Now there is one room in the legislature that is private for legislators. I think the door is always open and you can sort of peer in. Yeah. So. Other questions? Yes? Well, um, I travel a bit and people are always asking me about um, our legislators in Washington because they're always so impressed with who we send to Washington. And my explanation, I'm checking this out with one of those things, is that when I first moved here, I was told I had to sign the three man's oath and my back went up. And I said, well, may I read it first? And they said, of course. And I read it and I thought, this is why Vermont has a different kind of legislator because they believe that you vote your conscience rather than party or personal gain. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, I hadn't thought about it and it's as good an explanation or it shows what goes into the thought process of, of, of Vermonters. Um, so I'll agree with that. <laughs> so other questions, comments? Yes? I have a comment. Uh, when, when Jeffords switched parties, um, I thought that maybe the Republicans there would say, hmm, he must be up to something. He, he must be saying something to us to follow. And, um, I was really disappointed, being so naive then, um, that they actually turned on him. Uh, it really astounded me. It still does, actually. I'm not so well, and Republicans here in the state, uh, the sort of diehard Republicans, you know, I mean, uh, not you know, most of Vermont tends to be independent. Um, we don't have party registration, as you all know, but um, there were a number of uh, Republicans in Vermont who said, um, he should resign his seat, hold a special election, and let's see if he still gets elected. Mm -hmm. uh, because he had just run in 2000, yeah. and he had run as a Republican, and they, so the Republicans were saying, you know, you ran under false pretenses. Mm -hmm. And everyone else, including Chip Jeffords, but most of the analysts were also saying, people know exactly who Jim Jeffords is. He, you know, when he first uh, went to Washington, um, he voted against Reagan's budget. Well, it wasn't first, you know, he, that would have been 1981, or 
Um, he, he, he voted against Clarence Thomas, who's the only Republican to vote against Clarence Thomas, who's the only Republican, and you can list four or five or 10 or 20 things where he stood alone. And so him voting against President George Bush's tax cut, there should have been a Vermonter surprised by that. Um, and people knew what they were getting with Jim Jeffords. Uh, you know, he was, um, uh, he, he was independent even before he was an independent. Yes? Um, there was a moment in Howard Dean's career when he shouted out loud or something yes. and the, oh, to yeah, talk yeah. the yeah. somebody yeah. in the Democratic yeah. Party wanted to get rid of him, I think, because yeah. they made such a thing about that. Could you address that? Yeah, so that was the Iowa caucus. Um, and uh, the Dean scream, they called it. Um, and it makes good TV uh, to talk about the Dean scream. But the truth is that Howard Dean had lost the presidency before the scream. Because that day, he had come in, I think it was third or fourth, I think it was third, in the Iowa caucuses, which he was supposed to win. And so um, that, he, he was completely, he was done. Put a fork in him uh, when he lost that caucus. So Iowa was the first vote, and he had been flying high all through 2003. And 2004 started, and the Iowa caucus came, and he, he just did a belly flop. And so, there was no way for him to come back after a loss that devastating in Iowa. Um, the screen made a good, good theater for some of the people. Um, and it, it took about a week for people to sort of figure out, and I think it was ABC News that figured out that it wasn't really a screen. They sort of, it was the way the microphone worked. Um, and, how he couldn't be heard in the hall. Um, so he was saying, you know, we're going on to North Carolina, we're going on. And he was holding it like this, and it was, you know, so. Um, but by that time, he'd lost New Hampshire. And what happened, what happened there was, John Kerry was supposed to win the nomination in 2004. And then Howard Dean came along, knocked Kerry uh, off the pedestal, and Howard Dean was the front runner for all of 2003, and he was raising a ton of money and everything. And everyone wrote off John Kerry. What happened was John Kerry had working for him, one of the best political operatives in the world. And that person, very quietly, went into Iowa and worked for two months quietly organizing the caucuses. And as you all know, a caucus is a strange bird it's not like a primary. Polling can't tell you anything. You only know when the caucus results come in how you did. Howard Dean um, had a lot of support, and yet he didn't have a lot of campaign infrastructure. His campaign manager at the time, Joe Trippi, was really good on style. And, could, and, and did all of these wonderful things to help Howard raise money, but was not organizing at a caucus level in Iowa. And so the political press was shocked that John Kerry won Iowa. And so that changed the whole dynamic. And it might have been different if Howard had even come in second, but I think Dick Gephardt came in second. I, I no longer quite remember. Or John Edwards came in second. And Howard was, you know, pretty distant third, and so it just uh, John Kerry changed the dynamics. And once you get past Iowa, things happen so fast uh, that then it was Kerry's nomination. Um, so it wasn't the screen, um, but and when Howard Dean talked about it after the campaign, you know, he he acknowledged that he just said that our campaign peaked too early. You know, in his mind, he thought he would do well in New Hampshire, and he could be quiet behind the scenes building a structure. But what happened was, he was flying so high 
that he had to feed that image, and he couldn't be down there doing the, the real important uh, structural work to build a good campaign. Uh, so. Any other questions? Yes? And what would you say was Bernie's downfall? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, because I, 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 I think each of the campaigns were a little different. Um, um, and I think that in the most recent campaign, um, the progressives got too progressive in being out there and sort of saying, here's what we're going to do. And um, we've even seen it since then with the first year of Biden's presidency and some of the, you know, the perception became that if you uh, nominate or elect Bernie, all of this is going to happen. And, and I think some people, and we're talking then establishment, corporations, got really scared mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, went to work. Can we change. just lose the mic, do you think? Uh, keep going. I think. Well, is, are we running out of gas? Yeah, I think so. We on have this no mic? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's probably Bob's way of telling me that I'm going to He said, you've only got, uh, you know, six gallons of gas, and when you're done, you're done. Yes, go ahead. So, and we're probably getting close to being done, so. Yeah, but I have a question, too. Okay. So we'll take two more questions, yours and Bob's. I have an observation of the story. I do think that if people um, start their political career on the ground floor in Vermont, they, they, they wear a lot of shoe leather, uh, they, they meet people face to face. There's sure. that intimacy that you've talked about. Uh, I also think that through the town meeting and select board meetings and so forth, people fine tune their pragmatism, learn to compromise, learn to see another person's yeah. point of view and be respectful. And that carries forward. And I can think of one story I wanted to share among many, but um, I came to Vermont in 1970 and went to Goddard College. And they had um, a history professor, Lee Webb, who taught a Vermont history class. And at that time, uh, undergraduate students and community members were invited to uh, these courses. And so we had maybe 10 people in this Vermont history class, and we had Bernie Sanders and Bill Doyle <laughs> at the same table. And it was early in Bernie's arrival in, in Vermont, but what, as an undergraduate, I came away with was this wonderful repartee they had in, in talking to each other and talking to Lee Webb and talking to the students. Um, that really uh, got me excited about Vermont governance and Vermont politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really think the fact that Bill Doyle, the Republican, and, and Bernie Sanders, the Socialist, you know, could have these really um, knowledgeable discussions about the subject matter and be respectful mm -hmm. to each other uh, was very impressive. And I think what, the point you were making at the beginning is one I'll, I want to just elaborate on for a minute because I think there's a lesson there for us too. Um, our citizen legislature is, um, is a great asset for the state. It's also a liability these days. And, um, but let's talk first about the asset. Um, our citizen legislators have to live with us and among us. And so, you know, the story that, or the person people use as the, as the example is Dick Mazza, owns Mazza's country, uh, general store in Colchester, and you know, on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, he's behind the meat counter, and then Tuesday through Friday, he's doing that. And um, Ginny may remember the name, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but I, ha I used to use an example of um, Cole Hudson, 
Cola Hudson was uh, the janitor up at Linden State College, and yet in the legislature, he was the chairman of the House Government Operations yeah. Committee. And um, to me, that was the epitome of a citizen legislature. Uh, and, and so our legislators, they can't escape you. They have no staff. They are in your stores. They're in your communities. When I say that it's now, I think, become a liability in some way, it's because legislation at the state government level has become so complicated now, and the issues are so complex. The idea that we have a four-month legislature with basically no staff, and I, in my mind, not, really, not paid enough for some people to make the commitment. Yeah. Is a, is, a, is a very serious issue because um, what it does is it gives more power to the lobbyists mm -hmm. who have the expertise to show up with the data and no one knows whether that's right or not, or the executive. Mm -hmm. So the power tends to be um, held by the executive and the lobbyists and the citizen legislators are sort of playing catch up. I think we've changed, seen a little change in dynamic uh, in the demographics too of who our citizen legislators are now. You know, used to be first of all farmers. Um, they're either retired people or they're young people who really want to make this into a career. And it just, I think we need to at some point bite the bullet and 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 come up with the money um, and say, you know what, we need to. You know, legislature is afraid to even raise its pay a little. Or, or to increase their expenses because that's the easy thing for the press to go after and for people to say, yeah, those folks in Montpelier, they're getting rich. Well, you know, I remember when I used to give visiting editors and other people tours of the State House, um, you know, the first thing they'd say is, where are their offices? <laughs> huh? Where are they? And, uh, so. and Bob, you get the last question. You, you've spent this whole career watching the politicians and being known as a, an, an honest... An, yeah. Yeah. You, you, spent, you spent your whole career watching the politicians and you have a great reputation for integrity. Has anybody leaned on you to slant the news? <laughs> you know, one of the things about um, getting older is you forget, so... Uh, <laughs> Nancy, do we have any, you know, did we get any cars or any? Threats? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I think not, uh, but I do think, you know, it's, it's really tough uh, to be a reporter in Vermont where you have these relationships. Um, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, Jenny um, when they were taking over Dick Snelling's office. Dick Snelling was the first governor that I covered full time. Um, and I, I had great respect for him. Um, but I remember once he came to a, member, a meeting of the Vermont Press Association, and he sort of ranted for a while about how poor the press coverage is and how important it is because the only way that the public knew, and this was true at the time, it's not true today, was what the Burlington Free Press said about Dick Snelling. You know? and so, it gave me pause to realize uh, the power that was there, especially then. You know, it, it, when today, if you want, you can watch a legislative hearing at home. You can watch your select board's meeting without ever leaving your couch. You can read discussions on Front Porch Forum um, all day long. Um, and, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, and you know, into the 90s, um, the public's perception of what was going on at the State House or with politicians came directly through what people read in the Burlington Free Press, the Rutland Herald, the Times Argus, or they saw in CAX at a time when CAX was pretty powerful. Um, and you know, so uh, I, I guess. Um, I'll end on this down note, um, you know, that we have lost, a, we've gained a lot by having that direct access down, but we've lost a lot in Vermont by not having a, 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 a vigorous press. 
anymore. Um, you know, to uh, we still subscribe to the Burlington Free Press and the Times Argus because uh, Nancy reads them each morning to see who's in the obituaries. Because uh, there's not a lot else there anymore. You know, the, the press doesn't exist. Um, that is, uh, and, and so we're, we're in this transition now where we're seeing the new models of VT Digger and, and VPR and um, you know, Seven Days is stepping up. But we, we, don't, um, we don't have a vigorous press right now. And, and that's, a, that's a thing to be worrisome about. Um, I'll close by saying I uh, hope you get out in the sunshine. And it is always an honor uh, to be here and to have this uh, distinction of being the only family. Um, I know some of you were uh, a little disappointed. You didn't read it closely when you saw that it wasn't Garrett Graff uh, speaking today, because I now get that. It used to be when Garrett was growing up, you know, he heard, you know, well, Chris Graff's your father. Um, now, everywhere I go, it's like, yeah, yeah, Garrett Graff, is he uh, related to you? I said, yes, he is. Buy his book today. Thank you very much.